morning. Uh, we have one more week in Ephesians next Sunday, and then we're going to start a series through the chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That will take us through the Easter season and a few weeks um, after that. Um, so I, I grew up in an era where <clears throat> um, kind of the late 70s, 80s, um, where one of the primary toys that I played with as a boy uh, was the old school um, G.I. Joe dolls, for lack of a better word, figures, action figures. They were basically Barbie for boys. Remember this? It's like the same size as the Barbie, uh, but it was like uh, soldiers and cowboys and things like that. And so I spent a lot of time, um, I think my dad had like handmade these little boxes and I'd keep all the gear and characters in. And I would spend a lot of time um, arming them up for battle. Tiny little helmets, uh, little guns, machine guns, little handguns, uh, scuba gear for the uh, old school G.I. Joe. Am I the only one that knows what I'm talking about? You had to get prepared for battle. And man, I had some epic wars um, in the, the halls of our house or in my bedroom playing with those uh, G.I. Joe action figures, which by the way, if you kept them in pristine condition, are worth a lot of money now. Um, it was a rude awakening for me when I um, went to my parents' house one time and realized all my boyhood toys are now on eBay, being sold by my dad for money. That's what happens, right? G.I. Joe. Um, no matter what you're looking at, if it's uh, some type of war or military engagement, some type of sporting event, if it's a band, um, even if it's you're going camping, uh, proper equipment is essential uh, to what you're doing. Uh, when we were living um, on the West Coast, we had a family in our church that had a spot up in um, Utah that we would go up um, and camp every once in a while. And the difference in being in the desert of Nevada and the mountains of Utah was a significant temperature drop, one that I wasn't actually prepared for the first time that we went up there. And uh, Reagan was just, my middle daughter Reagan was just a small girl at the time, and we decided we're going to sleep out in a tent, and so we did. <coughs> and I didn't have any kind of um, sleeping bag or, you know, winter weather gear. I, mean, I lived in the desert, right? It's 120 degrees. And it would get up to like, it would get down to like 20s up on the uh, mountaintops of Utah. And so there we were. Um, up there in this tiny tent, and the only thing I had to keep warm through the night was a uh, Disney slum princess slumber bag. So not even a sleeping bag, a slumber bag. And so I just held little Reagan while she shivered the entire night and tried to stay warm in my Disney princess slumber bag. And I realized I didn't have the equipment for that. I wasn't ready for it. I was improperly equipped uh, for what was lying ahead of me. We have reached the end of Paul's letter and Paul to the Ephesians, and Paul spent the first half of the letter telling us um, who we are in Christ. That's the foundation of our spiritual journey, knowing who we are. He, spent, he has spent the second half, chapters 4 through 6, um, telling us how to live it out, how to walk it out <coughs> in everyday life. And Paul, in this letter and his other writings, he has no interest in a faith that is not lived out in the ditches and trenches of everyday life. Uh, that's the biblical story. That's the biblical narrative. Like when you read the redemption story of the Bible, it is a people, the people of God, who live out their faith in the ditches and trenches of life, the everyday grind of everyday living. And Paul's final section here reads almost like a motivational speech of a general who is inspiring his army before they head out into battle. Uh, verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. This finally, some of you are like, we're finally getting to the end of Ephesians, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, finally. Paul says, before I end this thing, and he said a lot, hasn't he? Like he's had a lot to say um, in these, these chapters. Um, but Paul says, the final thing I've got to say before I close this out, 
Before I end this, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. In the previous section, Paul was building on this idea of pay careful attention to how you walk, how you walk out your spiritual identity. And now he ends his letter by saying, pay attention to how you stand, how you stand. And we are to pay attention because Paul says there is a spiritual, there is a cosmic dimension to this everyday walk, to this everyday grind, that there are unseen forces at work who are seeking your destruction. And so his charge is to be strong, be strong. Now, let me do a little bit of uh, kind of Greek grammar here for you because I think it's so important. Uh, This phrase, be strong, is a translation of a certain tense in the original language that is um, kind of a, a kind of a mismatch of two tenses that really shouldn't be together. <clears throat> the first tense is an imperative. Now, if you know English, remember English class, an imperative is a command. Go do something, right? Um, start doing this, stop doing this. We, an imperative tense is a command, um, even our English. Um, the, what often goes with an imperative is the active voice, like go do something, this action, take action. That's what a command is, take action and do something. But Paul doesn't use an active voice here. He uses a passive voice. A passive voice means something that's done to me, right? The active voice is I hit the baseball. Uh, The passive voice is I get hit by the baseball, right? Um, It's the difference in active and passive. And so Paul kind of does a mishmash here where he uses an imperative command, and then he uses a passive voice. And so the idea here is do what I say. There's an active element like be strong, But there's also the passive element that really means to be made strong. That God enables our strength. That it is something that is done on our behalf. He is the source of our strength. That we find our power to stand in Christ. That there's no reason to fight in our own strength. Because our strength comes from him, that we are in Christ. This is a simple illustration. I think maybe I've used this illustration before. Um, In the uh, classic Disney movie, The Lion King, there's the scene when uh, little Simba is trying to find his way and knows he's going to be the next king. And if you remember the the storyline, he makes his way out into the... uh, Elephant graveyard, remember this? It's like off limits where he's not supposed to go. It's kind of the badlands. And so um, he makes his way out there, and then there's these hyenas uh, that uh, realize who he is, <coughs> and they're going to they're gonna, you know, take their shot at little Simba. And Simba just can't wait till he's king, right? That's the song that happens in that time frame. And so he's trying to man up and show that he's like the next lion king. In the meantime, Daddy King, Mufasa, um, is looking for little Simba, and he realizes where he's at, and so he makes his way out there to protect him. And in that moment, there's the confrontation between the hyenas and little Simba, <coughs> and they're teasing him. And they basically say, let me hear you roar, right? You're such a big, a big lion, let me hear you roar. You remember what happens? Uh, little Simba musters all he can, his little strength and energy up to roar, and lets out his loudest roar, and the hyenas start laughing, and so then he's like, gears up, and is going to let it go again, not knowing in the meantime that Mufasa has come in behind him. And so when little Simba lets out his roar, it's not Simba's roar, it's Mufasa's giant lion roar that happens and sends the, uh, sends the hyenas uh, running away. And so uh, it's kind of the same idea here, that we are active in our pursuit, in our being strong, But at the end of the day, it is God, it is His strength, His power, His might that enables us to stand. And then Paul tells us how this takes place in verse 11. (coughs) Stand in the strength by putting on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Put on the whole armor, again, of God. His armor. 
Do not enter the war unprepared. Put on his armor. We fight in his strength with his armor. And the reason why we need his strength and armor, Paul says, is that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And that word schemes is exactly what you think it would be. He doesn't play fair. He's crafty. He's deceptive. He's not fighting a fair fight. He's looking to trick and deceive and manipulate and do whatever it takes to bring us down. And so we don the armor of God so that we might stand against the schemes of the devil. And then he builds on this in verse 12. For we do not wrestle, not struggle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Um, and kind of according to how you're kind of wired, you're kind of like, whoa, uh, what's up with all the spiritual darkness stuff? But really what Paul's saying is like we need God's strength because of who our enemy is. Like, we must know who we're fighting. That's important in a fight. Like, if you follow any kind, of, any kind of physical combat sport or competition, if it's boxing or uh, UFC or whatever it might be, um, it's important to kind of know who you're fighting. You better scout out who you're going to fight before you put on the gloves, before you get into the, the ring. You have to know who you are fighting. You have to know if they're bigger, stronger, their strengths, their weaknesses. And Paul's telling us here, like, you have to know who you're fighting. Our fight is not a flesh and bone fight primarily. It is a fight against spiritual forces of evil. So that tells us two things about this fight. One, it's supernatural. It's a supernatural fight. It's in the spiritual realm, the cosmic realm. Now, I, I love what Paul said way back in uh, chapter 1, verse 21, um, I don't have this verse on the screen for you, but when he's talking about that we are in Christ, that he, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, now, this is what he says about Christ, that he's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. So again, we have to flash back to chapter 1 to be reminded here that even though this is a supernatural uh, war, a supernatural battle, that Jesus is above every power, that he's above every authority, that he's above every dominion. And so there's a danger here to live unaware of the nature of the battle because it's outside of what we can just see and feel and touch and hear. It's outside the physical realm. This fight is supernatural at some level. And then the fight is also, the language he uses here is a personal fight. Now, this word that's translated wrestle is the idea of a struggle. It's a hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's blood and sweat and tears. And the language that Paul uses here, he borrows uh, from the Greco-Roman world of wrestling, uh, which was not WWE-style wrestling or UFC wrestling. There's no tapping out um, in, this, in this type of wrestling. In Greco-Roman wrestling, it was oft often a fight to the death. Last man standing wins. And that's what Paul's saying here. This is hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is personal. You're at war with spiritual forces of darkness who are out to destroy you. And so we can take that and we can kind of, you know, we can kind of make that into some uh, supernatural movie, some like, you know, in our minds, whatever, Exorcist or Rosemary's Baby or whatever it might be, and we can kind of turn it into something like that and miss the point of what Paul's saying. Paul's saying that there is something going on around us that is bigger than us. And this is a spiritual war. And if you're oblivious to it, you're not going to know who you're fighting. And the fight's going to be real, impersonal, supernatural. And so he's equipping us to fight this fight we cannot even see. Verse 13. <coughs> Therefore, because of this fight, because of the nature of it, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. This fight is only won through his strength. Paul says, therefore, because of the nature of the fight, because it's supernatural, 
because it's spiritual, because it's personal, because it's cosmic, because it involves evil forces of darkness. Paul says you have to put on the full armor of God, all of his armor. Like, do not leave any area vulnerable to attack. Because if you do, that's where the enemy's going to attack. So, like, do not leave any area vulnerable. Put on the full armor of God. And when you have armed yourself with his armor and in his strength, Paul says, you will be prepared and ready to stand. The implication here is if you're not properly armed and prepared, then you're going to be easily attacked, easily wounded. You're going to leave yourself vulnerable. The battle will reach you. It will reach you. So armor up. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're not exempt. You don't get out of the battle. You don't like, eh, spiritual warfare, I'm just not into that. The battle will reach you. It will reach you. Now, Paul turns his attention to the armor itself, and he gives us a visual here um, of the armor, uh, most likely because, if you remember way back at the beginning, he wrote this letter most likely from prison. And so Paul is either probably chained to some Roman Praetorian guard right now, um, or he's surrounded by him. And so it's easy to make a visual when you're like surrounded by soldiers, right? And so Paul's able to kind of see and uh, pin out what's going on here. And so he gives us these seven pieces of equipment. Each one is necessary. We'll go through them right quick. Um, he talks first about uh, verse 14a, the belt of truth. Uh, stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Uh, the belt of truth. Uh, the, 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 the armor would contain this kind of wide belt-like leather apron that was worn under the armor that kind of held everything in place and held weapons, and it protected the uh, abdomen and the groin areas of the soldiers. Uh, this piece of equipment was also fastened really tightly and enabled them to remain upright in the battle. Paul equi equates this to the truth of God. That is the truth of God that helps protect us in our most vulnerable areas, that keeps us upright. Without truth, we are vulnerable to the schemes of the adversary. And our adversary, by the way, has a title. He is the father of lies. So any type of falsehood is a chink in our armor. The belt of truth. Now, we read from Isaiah 11 in our, in our call to worship. And sometimes we miss this in Ephesians chapter 6 when we're going through the spiritual armor. Uh, we miss that Paul, this Old Testament scholar, is actually kind of going Old Testament on us uh, when he links all these things out that he's referring, think about it here, his armor, put on the armor of God, um, stand in his strength. Um, and so he's laying out for us what the Messiah has already accomplished and was prophesied about the Messiah in the book of Isaiah. And so in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5, um, it recalls the belt of truth where the prophet describes the Messiah who will wear faithfulness as a belt around his waist. A believer who wears the belt of truth is sharing the armor of Christ himself. He is the Messiah. We are in Christ. And so being in Christ, just like the Messiah would, would don the belt of faithfulness, they'd be faithful and true. And so we are able to equip ourselves with the belt of truth based on the truth that we are in Christ and that he is the truth. Second piece of equipment. Part, last part of the same verse. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, the breastplate would have been a tough kind of sleeveless piece of metal that covered the chest. It protected the torso, the heart, the lungs against attack, the uh, vital organs against um, sword uh, stabs and spears and things like that. In this context, the idea of righteousness is uh, right conduct, right thought, right speech, right behavior that flows out of our right standing with God. That righteousness protects our sense of right and wrong, and it enables us to make right and wrong decisions. The reference back here is Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17. The Messiah, the Lord, puts on righteousness as his breastplate to battle against his enemies for the sake of justice and salvation. Again, we are equipped with his armor in the battle against darkness. And so the Lord who put on the breastplate of righteousness to do cosmic battle against the spiritual 
forces to secure justice, to secure salvation, equips us with his armor to be able to make right decisions and live with um, ethics in the world in which we live. Number three, verse 15, the shoes. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Shoes of readiness with the gospel of peace. Footwear was essential to the Roman soldier's success. Uh, They had different types of footwear that they would wear. Um, At times they would wear kind of what you might see in movies, kind of the sandals if they were marching long distances. They needed their footwear to be light um, and more kind of athletic. At times where it was just kind of hand-to-hand combat, they would often wear shoes that would have spikes or almost like we would know as, as metal cleats where they could stand firm. They had specialized shoes based on the type of battle that they were in. We have specialized shoes, don't we? Uh, We have basketball shoes and football cleats and golf shoes and running shoes and shoes to wear on the beach and shoes to climb the side of a mountain. We have all kinds of specialized shoes. Uh, Their shoes were for standing one's ground in hand-to-hand combat. And the connection that Paul makes here is that believers are to be prepared to transport the gospel message of peace, that we are to share and promote the peace of the gospel. The reference here again is Isaiah 52, uh, verse 7. Paul actually also borrows this phrase in Romans chapter 10 and verse 15. There he speaks of the beauty of the feet of those who proclaim the good news of the gospel of peace. When he talks about peace here, he's talking about peace with God, that we are no longer at spiritual enmity with God, but we have the, the gospel has made peace with God. And he's also talking about the peace of God that resides in our hearts as those who follow Christ and are in Christ, that the peace of Jesus is in our hearts and lives, that he is in control, that the battle is already won, and that our feet are equipped, that we are to take the gospel of peace and to proclaim the gospel of the good news, and we are to have an urgency and a readiness about uh, this proclamation. Verse 16. The shield of faith in all circumstances, all circumstances. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Roman soldiers would have uh, shields that were often uh, four feet by two feet. They're almost like a small a little door. If you've ever watched kind of movies that come out of that era, you might remember uh, where the soldiers would kind of link um, the shields together almost to provide a wall, and then they would put them over their heads even to, to protect themselves from the arrows that would be shot from uh, distant armies or even from uh, the gates of, 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 of cities, fortified cities that they were attacking. Soldiers could put their entire body behind this shield for protection from arrows, spears, swords. Uh, the old, I think it was the movie 300, where the proclamation is made to the Spartans, like, um, come home either with your shield or come home on your shield. That's your two options, right? Uh, to fight with the shield of uh, faith, that we are instructed to wear, to don the shield of faith in all circumstances, that there is no moment in spiritual warfare in which the shield of faith is not important, that above any other peace. It provides protection for the believer. And Paul's purpose here is that it protects us from the flaming arrows of the enemy. Like, that is some vivid imagery. Think about that imagery. Uh, One, that the flaming arrows are a very kind of harrowing threat, aren't they? Um, A scary idea. And often flaming arrows caused a lot of panic among the soldiers, that if they came out from behind their shields and got hit by a flaming arrow that they would literally burn to death. And so it was a very harrowing experience that caused a lot of panic and that we are to regard the arrows of our enemy as a serious threat that can devastate our spiritual well-being, that can devastate our everyday lives. Notice also like these arrows would be shot from a distance. This wasn't up close personal hand-to-hand combat. That's the advantage of the flaming arrow, that the enemy Uh, would attack up close in hand-to-hand combat, but they would also attack indiscriminately, right? And again, I hate to keep flashing back to movies, but we've all kind of seen those those scenes where they're shooting the arrows and it's just coming through the air and just hitting random uh, people. They're just firing and hitting whoever they can, whenever they can. The enemy's desires to engulf us in flames of 
lust and temptation and deception and lies. And honestly, without the spiritual armor, we, we burn easily, don't we? These arrows also remind us that his attacks are nullified through faith, through trusting God. That God is able to protect us as we rest in him and trust in him that we do not have to be afraid. That we do not have to be panicked. That he has won the battle over and over and over and over again. Particularly in the Old Testament and even into the New We are reminded by many of the songwriters and many of the poets of the Bible that God is our shield, that God is our protector, and that he protects and shields us because of his love and care for his people, that we can have confidence in his protection that keeps us safe from harm, that we can trust in him and rest in him and believe in him, even in the intensity of the battle, that God is the one who is fighting the battle on our behalf, and that we can put our faith and trust in him. And then these last two pieces of armor are found in verse 17. First, the, uh, hel- take the helmet of salvation, Paul says here. Uh, Romans had some of the most advanced helmets of their day. Uh, they protected not only their heads, but their neck areas. There was very little exposed except for their eyes and their mouth. And these helmets provided confidence. Uh, the helmet provides confidence. Uh, one of the greatest battlefields that you will face in your spiritual life is the battlefield of the mind, uh, what goes on uh, between the ears. And salvation provides me the assurance that is necessary to live in victory. This helmet of salvation, again, recalls Isaiah fifty nine seventeen, where the Lord uh, wears his helmet to overcome his enemies, that we share in his armor in our battle. And then this final piece of equipment, the sword of the Spirit, again, that's found in verse 17. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The Roman soldier's double-edged sword uh, was his most effective weapon in up-close hand-to-hand combat. It was primarily an offensive weapon. Isaiah eleven fourteen, the Messiah strikes the land with a scepter from his mouth. He kills the wicked with a command from his lips. It is the word of God that vanquishes the enemy, that kills the wicked. Clearly, this is an offensive maneuver deployed by the Messiah against his enemies. His word is our offensive weapon to be used against spiritual enemies. Think about Jesus in the desert when he's tempted by the great tempter, tempted by Satan himself. It was the word of God that Jesus quoted and spoke that he used offensively in his moment of greatest temptation. The Word of God also, Hebrews tells us, penetrates our own inner being and carves away those parts of our heart that are not God-like. And so that's why we say repeatedly here at City Church, like, get the Bible in you. Get the Word of God in you and let it do its internal work so that we might be equipped for this battle that we're in. Paul concludes his analogy by reminding us to saturate our preparation in prayer. Uh, We saw that in verse 18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. We'll circle back to that uh, next week and pick up that. But Paul speaks of a posture of prayer and this demeanor uh, for the follower of Jesus of readiness and urgency. He says, equip yourself on all occasions with all kinds of prayer and requests, that we are to be continually alert and persistent in prayer in this spiritual battle. So let me uh, bring this section to a close by just reminding us of three so important things from this text. Number one, like do not forget the battle that we're in is real. It's a real battle. Um, We can read things like this and we can kind of, you know, uh, think in, in outside of our world terms and you know, what are we talking about, Harry Potter here? You know, we kind of have our idea of what spiritual warfare looks like, and we, we kind of like fail to grasp our need for protection, spiritual protection in this battle. Uh, Paul, in this text, assumes that we need protection, doesn't he? He assumes it. He assumes, like, you got to be engaged in the battle. You need protecting. Because Paul knows that the battle will reach us in the ditches and trenches of life. Everything he's just been talking about. He knows that the spiritual battle is going to hit you in the walls of your house. It's going to happen in your marriage relationship. It's going to happen in your parenting. 
It's going to happen at work. It's going to happen in the grind of everyday life, trying to live in fellowship with other believers. We do not live on neutral turf. A carefree Christian life does not exist. The spiritual battle will reach you. Now, I get, like, spiritual warfare is a complicated subject. And kind of based on how you're wired, whether you like to study these type of things, or you're kind of wired toward these type of things or not, um, we, kind of, we tend to do one of two things. Uh, we either tend to underestimate the enemy, and we ignore it and uh, pretend he doesn't exist, and we kind of um, underestimate what's going on. Uh, but I want to tell you, if, like, the enemy is very real, and he is active, and Satan and his minions, uh, they can cause some real chaos and some mayhem and some destruction. And so we must guard against him. Uh, Peter says that he's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. devour. He has one agenda, to seek, to kill, maim, to destroy. There's no positive end game with the enemy. He is out to obliterate you, your family, everything about you. So we don't want to underestimate him. There's also a tendency among certain circles to overestimate the enemy, that we see him behind every negative thing that happens in life, that um, Satan's kind of um, hiding behind every rock, that there's a demon behind every flat tire, uh, flat tire. And so we tend to make him more powerful than he is or give him more credit than he is due. Uh, let me be really crystal clear right now. The devil is not on par with God. They're not in some supernatural cosmic battle to see who's going to win. They're not locked in some kind of battle for the souls of humanity. The devil cannot make you do anything, no matter what Flip Wilson said. People 65 and older got that joke and... No one under six, like, like, who is Flip Wilson? He was famous for saying, the devil made me do it. He cannot make you do anything. He can tempt you. He can deceive you. He can connive you. He can lure you. He can entice you. He can trick you. He can coax you. And he will do all these things. But he cannot force you to do anything. Because he is not God. So do not underestimate him and fall prey to his tactics. But do not overestimate him and forget this next point that I want to remind us of. The victory's already won. We do not overestimate him because the victory is already claimed. So... As we are engaged in this spiritual battle of everyday life, I've got good news for you. If you're in Christ, there's no reason for alarm. There's no reason for worry. There's no reason to struggle over the outcome of our spiritual battle. Jesus has already won. Evil is defeated. Sin is conquered. Satan is is vanquished. All that stuff happened on the cross. It is not up for debate on how this thing ends. Now, we live in the in-between, right? We live in the here and now. And so I get that the struggle is still real. I get that the brokenness is still here. I get that sin is still here and that we have to wrestle with temptation and the brokenness and sin and struggles of life. I give that we're living in this in-between that we talk about now. But from an eternal standpoint, the victory is already won. And that's why I say to you guys regularly here at City Church, like when you come to City Church, I don't want you walking out of these doors afraid of what waits you on the other side. I don't want you living as a spiritual alarmist. I don't want you to live in worry on who's going to win this thing. I don't want you to be afraid of what's going to happen out there. Like there is a circle of people that profess to follow Jesus that live in a constant worry and alarm at there's bad stuff always right around the corner. That the devil's behind every rock. The good news of the gospel is good news. It is an announcement. 
And I want you to walk out of these doors every week that no, knowing that no matter what awaits me on the other side, the victory is already won. That Jesus is in absolute control. That evil does not win. That deception does not win. That destruction does not win. That whatever in your mind is the evil and enemy does not win. And sometimes we can get engaged in these culture wars and things are headed down south and are headed, headed um, in a direction that I'm not comfortable with or not how I grew up or what's happening around us or we need to get back to this or that. And we can get lost in the idea that the battle has already been won in Christ. We live from victory. We don't live for victory, hoping. We live from victory. That Jesus has already won the battle. We stand in his strength, not our own. We fight in his armor, not our armor. Now, with that being said, I'll do what Paul says here. The victory is already won, so what that means for us, fighting from victory, is that we simply need to armor up. Armor up. Let's go to war. Like, you have everything needed to stand in victory. You are in Christ. That's what you need. You're in Christ. He has done everything necessary. He has provided everything necessary. And by the way, if there's some part that he has not provided, there was no reason for him to come. If there was something that you can do, something you can contribute, some factor that you're involved in, there's no reason for the gospel. Christ came and provided everything necessary. And so what that means for us is we stand in his strength We wear his armor, and we armor up and go to war. We live so close to him that we draw from the resources that he possesses as our conquering king. We draw near to Christ, and it is in his strength that we have the faith to keep going. It is in his peace, that he is our peace, that we have the peace to keep going, that he is the truth which enables us to stand in the truth, that he was faithful to the end, which allows us to be faithful to the end, that he is completely righteous, which allows us to live in righteousness. It's not your armor. It's his armor. Stand in it. Having done all to stand, we stand. So armor up, man. There's a battle. Armor up. Ladies, armor up. Young people, armor up. Dads, moms, there's a cosmic battle over the soul of your little one. Armor up. Grandparents, armor up. Jesus follower, armor up. Not in your armor in his armor, not in your might, in his might. Some of you might be old enough to remember the 10-time Academy Award-winning movie, Lawrence of Arabia. I will not force you to show your age by raising your hand. If you saw it in the actual theater, Lawrence of Arabia, 1962, 10 Academy Awards. If you've watched the movie or know the storyline, it's based on a true story of T.E. Lawrence, who was a British officer in World War I. Aqaba, 1917, it was impenetrable. It was a, on the port, <coughs> they had these massive, huge naval guns for any ship that might come their way. Behind Aqaba, the city was a barren desert. To its east was the anvil of the sun. The Turks who occupied this area believed it to be safe from any attack because of its strategic position. They were wrong. Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence, this British officer of World War I, led a force of cavalry across the anvil of the sun. Um, He rallied support from local people. He invades the city from the north. And in the movie, there's a classic scene of a long panning and telling shot. It was unlike anything that had been shot previous to that of Lawrence of Arabia leading his troops 
past these gigantic naval guns that were pointed in the wrong direction. The city fell and the Turkish hold on Palestine was broken and replaced by British mandate and eventually the state of Israel. But the Turks made two mistakes in that battle. They underestimated and did not know their enemy and his tactics. And two, they didn't have the right weapons pointed in the right direction. Let's not make the same mistake in our spiritual battles. Be strong and in the Lord, in the Lord, and in the power of his might. The battle is real. The victory is won. Armor up. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Jesus